Every team, every topic, everywhere, this is Believe. Do you love watching live TV but are tired of your huge cable bill? Sling TV has the same top cable channels for as little as half the price, so you can save hundreds of dollars while still watching your favorite sports, news, reality TV, and more. Ditch cable and get Sling's total live streaming solution with free local channels. Setup and installation are included. Make the smart choice and switch to Sling TV. Get the best of cable for the best price. Learn more at sling.com slash cut cable. That's sling.com slash cut cable. Setup and installation included with $49 down and $20 a month for 12 months. Restrictions apply. Ich warte seit Wochen auf diesen Tag und tanz vor Freude über den Asphalt. Als wär's sein Rhythmus, als gäb's sein Lied, das mich immer weiter durch die Straßen zieht. Hello and welcome to Gegenpressing, the German football podcast from the Football Grad Network. I'm your host, Bryce Dunn, and joining me, as always, Manu Vett. Manu, how have you been? Yeah, excellent. Really good. Um, glad to be back on the West Coast. Been a bit nice and relaxing the last week or so, just working out, watching football, writing articles. So pretty good. Pretty good, Bryce. How about you? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad at all. Lots of the same working out. Just, uh, I suppose, enjoying this time of year. It's busy in my work. So yeah, not too bad. I spent the weekend back in Northern Ireland, and I happened to bump into somebody. And that person was Chris Williams. Chris, how are you? I'm very good. Uh, we should probably clarify that. We didn't bump into each other in Northern Ireland, did we? We bumped into each no. other at Gatwick Airport. Yeah, that's it. On the way back, we just missed each other by minutes on the way out. And yeah, then we did. on the so return. You got told to get on the wrong train, which yeah. meant that we didn't have a, a nice rendezvous um, before I went to Berlin. So I've been in Berlin for the weekend. Well, Berlin for the majority of the weekend, spent the um, afternoon and evening in Wolfsburg yesterday, which was very nice, and then came home today. Lovely. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that you enjoyed your time, and it was great to see you once again. Um, Guys, let's jump in. We've got plenty to discuss today, um, and a certain character, which definitely needs talking about, as as he's doing plenty of talking himself. Um, We kicked off the Bundesliga weekend with Hertha Berlin at home to Borussia Dortmund. The game ended one apiece. Um, We see now Dortmund come from behind with an equaliser from Kagawa. But um, the main talking point has been Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. Uh, He keeps being linked with a certain uh, club in London, and he once again did not start. Instead, he went to play five-a-side football with his buddies. Um, Chris, where do we even begin with uh, Aubameyang? I mean, we said it on the last pod. We've said it every transfer window since we've been podding that he loves to act around like this, doesn't he? Um, and almost flirts with the idea of going to other clubs. Uh, is, is there any movement on this? Do, do we think still that this is going to be the transfer window that he's shipped along? Well, uh, for me, I think this probably will be the one. That's my own personal opinion. I mean, Arsenal have submitted a fifty million euro bid for him, which has been rejected. That's the normal part of the course. First bids aren't normally accepted. He certainly up the ante. He normally just talks about you know, wanting to move on. This time he withdrew from the squad. Um, I think it was Thursday. He didn't fly to Berlin and he was given permission to negotiate, which I believe he's done. Um, and now it's for the clubs to thrash it out. But if someone asked me this on Twitter the other day. And you know my answer then is, um, is what it is now. Well, my answer now is what it was then, which is nothing would surprise me with the Bamiyang I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't go anywhere. And, you know, it was not all the ruse, but it, it was just smoothed over and he went back to playing um, at Dortmund. But this, it looks very, very terminal now. And there was quite a bit of a chatter around a press box on Friday night because I was at the Olympic Stadium for this game, um, especially actually on the walk to the Olympic Stadium. There was lots of chat from the fans not particularly happy about him. Um, but they're looking towards the future. So I think everybody else should start to look forward to the future because I, I don't think it's going to be with Pierre and Rick Aubameyang in a yellow and black shirt anymore. And what about you, Manu? Do you agree with Chris that this could be the last time that we see him in a yellow and black shirt of Dortmund? 
part of me almost hopes that that's it. Um, it. We chatted a bit about this off the pod, and it's getting it's getting a little tiring. It really is, you know, because for me, when I when I saw those pictures that he was playing in a Dembele shirt and and Duisburg at um, a soccer soccer five area with friends and i mean that's fine you know um everyone can do in their private time whatever they want to do but at the same time Ber- dortmund were needing him in berlin right and then the the fact that he was wearing a dembele shirt and that kind of the impression that i got is that he's trying to make himself look like a victim right because dembele had to go and strike to get his move to barcelona and all of a sudden Aubameyang is trying to victimize his situation. And I, that's, that's maybe that's a wrong impression, but that's the impression I got. And I think that is there's something, it's almost like a slap in the face for anyone who supports Borussia Dortmund, right? Because he makes a lot of money there. He's, it's not like that he is some poor guy who is forced into a contract. He doesn't get his big move. He doesn't get to play in the Champions League. He doesn't, you know, he's, we're talking about Arsenal London here. We're talking about a club that's not likely to play in the Champions League next year. Definitely is not going to win any titles. Yes, it's very difficult right now in Germany to win titles too with Bayern's, this, all the strengths that Bayern are showing, but it's not impossible. You're more likely to win a national title with Dortmund, I would say, than with Arsenal in England, especially with what Manchester City is doing there right now, right? So I think it's, it's such a massive slap in the face and it's so disrespectful towards the club and it's so disrespectful to the fans and we're, we're the basis of this game and this is something that gets forgotten. So that was almost for me, that's been the final straw in this entire thing that he's now trying to pretend he's the victim in this entire affair. And clearly he isn't. If he, he, his job is to fulfill his contract. And if he is not happy there and Dortmund don't want to sell, you know, a transfer sum is, is usually paid to break a contract. And clubs are quite happy to pay those sums for a player to get for them to get out of a contract. In the free market world, if you wanted to break a contract, you would have to pay money yourself, right? To get out of a contract and move to a different company. So, you know, I almost wish one club, and I know this is extremely unrealistic, but I almost wish a club would make, just make a stand and say, look, no, you're not going to get your move. You're on a contract. You signed this deal till 2021. That's a long time. You are, you, you're going to see out your contract and you're going to stay with us. And if you don't like it, then well, you go, if you don't perform, then you're going to sit on the bench or even worse on the tribune and you're going to watch, you know, see how your market value does there. And I think someone, someone has to finally draw that line. And I feel that Dortmund, yes, they're going to get 70 million euros maybe out of this deal. That's super. You know, how much money have they earned, Chris, in late, latest transfer windows? I mean, we, we, we summed up the figure. I think they earned 500 million euros in transfers since Sork took over. I don't think they need that extra money. And with the money that they have right now, they could sign someone like uh, Lautaro Martinez, who has been highly tracked, right, for 20 million euros from Argentina, a young kid who actually wants to be there and actually wants to play for the club and will probably do the same job. And maybe someone needs to buy it in a sour apple and say, well, Alba, that's tough luck. Here's your bench spot until you figure out your life that's where you're going to sit. But of course, that's unrealistic. And I mean, guys, who are we looking at possible uh, replacements? Obviously, uh, Martinez has been mentioned uh, by yourself, Manu. But uh, Chris, is there anyone else knocking around? Uh, some people are saying that a possible, another swap deal that Arsenal are going to be involved with will be uh, Giroud coming to Dortmund. What would you make of that deal? A good one? Bad one? I, I like Olivier Giroud. Got a lot of time for him. Um, I think he's... He's a he's a good guy. He's he doesn't strike me as um, one of those players who, you know, has got a bit of a bad attitude. He's always got a smile on his face. He looks to put in the effort. I think he's massively underrated in England. Um, he starts for France. Um, he's a player that plays full of passion. His movements well. He's exceptional in the air. Uh, I think he may be a, a pretty good fit over at Dortmund. Now whether they'd be happy to have him or not, that's that's a different matter. But he does start for France. I, I've got a lot of time for him. Is it possible? Well, Arsenal would hold all the cards on that. If they desperately want a Bamiyang and they won't go above what they've submitted at the moment, which is believed to be around 50 million euros, then you know there's a bargaining chip in there with Giroud, uh, with Giroud even. Um, we'll have to see how it goes. I 
think if he went to Dortmund, he could be a pretty good striker there um, in a sort of target man way. But he can play with the ball at his feet as well. So for me, if you're asking Bryce, would that be a good goer? I think he would. The one question I have is his age. First, he's 31. Right, you're replacing a 28-year-old striker with a 31-year-old striker, and um, I know there's so much youth on that side already. But wouldn't it be better to go for someone who's a little younger? Even even Fedor Smolov was the same age than Pierre Emerick Aubameyang. You know, the Russian striker was was breaking goal-scoring records in the Russian football Premier League. Might be, in my opinion, a better fit because at least you know you're getting one guy in the same age category. For another guy the same age category, you're going to get three, four years out of him, right? Whereas with Giroud, how many more years are you going to get? Two, three? Uh, that's that seems a, that's that's a bit of a question mark. Everything else, I agree. You know, you're not going to get the sort of antics that you had with Dembele and Aubameyang with Oliver Giroud. He's he's a gentleman through and through, and he's a professional through and through. I think, man, this is probably more of a question for the wider scheme for Dortmund and where do they see themselves because, um. You know, Dembele's gone, who's excellent. Obama Young is going to go. Gotts as well under form, really, if you put him to what he was three, four seasons ago. Uh, Marco Royce is injured. Mkhitaryan's not there anymore. Um, the back line is a little more stable at the moment. So there's you throughout that side. At some point, um, they're going to need somebody a little more established to give a bit of balance to that side. Otherwise, they're going to be this exciting young side. Um, that really doesn't kick into gear for another two to three seasons. I mean, um, Sancho on Friday was unbelievable. In the dull first half, he was the only thing that kept me motivated in the cold in the Olympic Stadium was watching him play. Second half, I thought he was fantastic. Once Isaac came on, they worked together really, really well. In fact, Isaac hit the bar in the closing stages, which would have been a fantastic goal from a brilliant passage of play. So it's... It's what of Dortmund's aspirations at the moment. If their aspirations are let's do a full rebuild, then um, probably Olivier Giroud is the wrong man. But if they still want to challenge for maybe the Pokal, in the meantime, when they're doing that rebuild, they need some sort of established player in there. And that's what Giroud would bring. So I think it's a question of, of where do Dortmund see themselves. But one thing that is certain is watching them on Friday night they are a little short in that striking area. Um, even when Yarmolenko came on, he wasn't that busy. And we're probably going to talk about the penalty that never was a penalty. Um, you know, he, he should have won that. That probably would have been a saving grace for him in that game. But bar that, he didn't look particularly good. But Sancho outshone everyone. He outshone Pulisic around him, who looked frustrated at times, lashed out, got himself a stupid, um, got himself a stupid caution. He was he was under par and, and Sancho was, was the main thing for me on Friday night for Dortmund. And as I say, Isaac came on, but is San, are Sancho and Isaac going to power them to a Pokal or to try and challenge, you know, maybe even challenging Bynes a little bit off? Are they going to be able to challenge the likes of, of the teams around them, Leipzig, etc.? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I think that in an ideal world, you're going to sell Aubameyang and you're going to bring, may bring in two strikers, right? Because Isaac, I think he, he's, he's a wonderful talent, but, um, people have to remember he's 18 and same with Sancho, who I thought I'm with you there. He, he was fantastic. He provides them the sort of football that Dembele offered to them, right? But he's 17 as well. It's a very, very young player. So I, I personally, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Fedor Smolov. Who's, who's now heavily linked with Dortmund once again, right? Was heavily linked with Dortmund when I was in Russia during the Confed Cup because everyone thought Aubameyang would leave in the summer and uh, Fedor Smolov was one of those guys linked. And Fedor Smolov is the kind of guy, you know, he's, he scored um, two and a half years ago in Russia. He scored 20 goals in 29 games. Last year, he scored 18 goals in 22 games. And this season, he's already on 10 goals in 13 games, you know. So you get a goal almost every game in a league. And, you know, people say, yeah, well, it's Russia. But Russia is also the league that has some of the lowest goal scoring in all of Europe. So it's a difficult league to get goals, to score goals. And um, he's friends with Andrei Amolenko. So that's someone I would like to see. And he's actually a year younger. I just looked it up. He's actually a year younger than Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. So 27. So perfect age. Um, to make that move, right? And have some, have his body already there who can help him make the transition. Um, I think would help. And then and on top of that, add another striker 
in Martinez. I think that is really what you need because when you look at the the top European sides, they all have, and this is this has been something that we've talked about so many times already, right, Chris? That the big German sides, Bayern have rectified that problem now by bringing Sandro Wagner, but the big German sides have always been a little bit short when it comes to strikers. Uh, Manu, can I just ask them, you know, for anyone that's unfamiliar with uh, Smolov, I mean, I'm guessing that Chris maybe hasn't seen too much of him. I certainly haven't seen too much of him. But what kind of player is he? Is is he a target man? Is he rapid? I mean, what, what, how would he fit in to the uh, Dortmund side? I mean, they've got some young fellas that are, are pretty quick. Uh, would it be better to get someone like Giroud in who, as Chris said, you know, can you know, can really do that link-up play, but also be that that guy in the area scoring a header for the likes of when Yarmolenko decides to, to put it into the box. Yeah, Smolov is a pretty big guy. He's, he's a meter 87. He's very athletic. He actually used to play on the left wing and then he was moved into the center. And when they moved him into the center, center all of a sudden he became this very good goal-scoring threat. Actually similar to what happened to Aubameyang. We remember Aubameyang started on the wing too and then was moved to the center by Klopp. So there's a, a similarity there. He's very fast for for a big guy, and he's very athletic. And um, you know, he's in recent years has become probably the best player in Russia, um, together with Quincy Promise, who's of course linked with several clubs all the time as well. The Dutch um, winger from Spartak Moscow. I, I personally think that he would offer them quite a lot. He's of course not quite as fast as Aubameyang, but then there isn't many players that are, and I'm not sure if that's necessarily what they need. The, con- considering how Dortmund play under Stöger, it's it's a little bit different anyways, right? So I think he, at the moment, he'd be a perfect player, but I don't think I don't think Dortmund should be looking at a one-player solution, Bryce. Um, I think they, they need to look at multiple guys, and they, I think personally they need to sign more than one player. Um, just to be a bit more flexible and maybe play with two strikers up front because that's that's another thing that's coming back into the league. Well, I, I, I would totally agree with you. I, I think a lot can be said for having someone uh, a bit older and experienced uh, and certainly a, a, a professional. You know, Aubameyang maybe not the, the greatest example leader off the pitch, um, but I think if they bring in another young striker, then it would definitely be a good idea to bring in someone experience a bit more worldly maybe um so i think you're absolutely right in that uh, chris can i just quickly ask them um, how much um is the likes of maybe sven mislintat um at arsenal having to do with maybe the obama uh transfer would, would he have much say in that is is that one of the reasons why you believe arsenal are after him or i mean like some mkhitaryans possibly uh going that way as well yeah that th- this might be a convenient assumption um I don't think he was brought in to poach Dortmund's current players. I think it's more likely getting Arsenal into a, a better way of thinking how they go out, recruit younger players, um, not stealing half their main team at the moment. And Chris, um, just to speak about Sancho, I mean, you said um, a lot of positive things um, were seen on the pitch you know, when playing on Friday night. Uh, is he the new Dembele? Wow, they're, um, I'd say they're big shoes to fill, aren't they? Um, but he's only young himself, then Bailey. Can we not just say that Jaden Sancho is the new Jaden Sancho? Um, hmm. Then Bailey and Sancho obviously uh, both play wide, but you know they're different players um, because they're different people. I think we should probably look that um, Sancho is the new Sancho for Dortmund and just don't give him any sort of. Um, labels on his back just let him get along and play and, and give him the sort of freedom and space that Peter Stoke has given him to just let him go and express himself and he likes to do that and he certainly did it on Friday night which is why he got our football grad man of the match I think it's great that Stoke is playing them both Sancho and um, Isaac because that's something that Bosch really shied away from right Chris I, I just I just think it's wonderful that Stoke said okay well we're going to bench Alba and we're going to play the young guys. I th- I think that is that is great because that's why you bring them in in the first place. Oh yeah, and you get guys like Isaac and Sancho who are chomping at the bit to get first team action. And when they take it, you know what young lads are like. They're raw, they're full of energy, and they just want to impress. Which is look back to what Dembele was doing, um, and and that's how you nurture and you, you blood players. And do you know what? If the next three or four games when they play. One of them has an absolute stinker. 
it's because they're 17 year old and that's what 17 year olds do they'll have a really bad game every now and again but you don't get on the back you just let them get on with it and that's I think that's why Peter Stoker's been brought in because the good work he did with Cologne the fact he can work with younger players and the fact he's he's a type of man manager to develop players so that's a really good fit in all for Dortmund at the moment Um, just unlucky that they came away with the draw I thought they were um, they were poor at times and excellent at the others it's probably the good old adage that if you want to win a football match you should probably start playing your best football somewhere before the 75 minute mark (laughs) and you know but they have a little bit of time I feel right now because we'll probably touch on that in a moment but everyone around the league behind Bayern is sort of dropping points left right and center and we get a new table um second to to 18 pretty much every match day so i feel like if dortmund have a couple match days where they figure things out and then hit their stride towards the end of the season it will be enough to to finish in the in the top four. Oh yeah definitely because there's four points that separate is it second to tenth or something daft like that yeah it's it's yeah it's it's cr- yeah that's right yeah I think Bryce, you have the table always I had in front of you. I, I think there is four or five teams right now on thirty one points, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's right. We've got four teams on thirty one, two on thirty, and then we've got three on twenty seven. So yeah, that's that second place has thirty one points and tenth place has twenty seven. Unbelievable. Yeah. So you know you it that, sixth place for Dortmund right now doesn't look great, but because um, a win can basically catapult you to second place next match day. I think that they have they can use the time right now that is a bit chaotic and just sort everything out. And then you know once the squad, once we know what happened with Alba, once we know who's coming in to replace him, um, I think they can really hit it for the rest of the season. Sometimes getting rid of someone like Alba Mayang um, gets a, gets a team settled right and then they can sort of just focus on getting achieving the best possible which this season is a top four finish get back in the champions league lick your wounds and then next year maybe next year finally challenge the big boys because i think i feel like um if any season this would have been a year where bayern could have had could have been challenged if not if not for the all the other teams in the league being so inconsistent um, manu very quickly before we move away from dortmund uh was it a penalty in the in the dying moment? Yeah, it was. I think. <laughs> <Where is that? laughs> I, and I think there's no two two ways about it. Um, I I feel like where we used the dark room a little bit too much in the first half of the season. This is, would have been an occasion where I would have liked to see it. I, I bet you you're the same opinion, Chris. Yeah, I mean, if only the Bundesliga had VAR. <laughs> then that could have been reviewed and a penalty could have been given because you won't see a more blatant <laughs> penalty all season. He was thrown to the ground by two arms. Yeah. And if Ma- only, eh? Mare Tabelle, the, the homepage that kind of tracks decisions and um, gives an evaluation, um, they had an 80%, 80% of the people on that side said it was a clear penalty. 10% were sort of 50-50 and the rest were Schalke fans. So... I mean, that gives you a clear <laughs> indication of of where that decision, which way that decision should have gone. Yeah, well, I think we've covered uh, Dortmund enough. But um, as the guys were saying, they're sitting in sixth, but they've got 30 points, one point behind second, and they've actually got a better goal difference than the teams around them. So a win at home to Freiburg uh, next time out could be a, a massive leap forward for them. But one of the uh, star performers of the weekend was Eintracht Frankfurt, who, who beat a Wolfsburg 3-1. Um, this was another impressive um, performance by them, which show, moves them up to seventh. So, yeah, they're on the same amount of points as Dortmund. Now, Chris, how impressive were Eintracht? They were very impressive, Bryce. I've, I've seen them a couple of times now. Um Last time I saw them live was way back on match day one when they played Freiburg away and they were poor that day. That was a really poor game um, to watch. This, they were a lot better. Um, just a connection between the midfield. Boateng was very good. Chandler was. Wolf was really, really good on the right-hand side. Um, they also looked very settled at the back. Um, Asebe's not been in for the most part um, recently, but he looked very good at the back. Um, Hadraki was not really bothered um, throughout the entire game. And then um, Haller, who was my man in the match, I just thought he had a fantastic game. I mean, if you've not seen his goal, it's unbelievable the way he holds off 
um, Tisserand, just like almost like a basketball player. I was speaking to um, Abel, 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 our our friend um, from Talking Football, was in the um, press box, and we were chatting about that afterwards. The way you know he just backed into Tisserand like like a basketball player does, and then you know turns and and then shoots. And it was such a good goal, and he smashes that ball. Um, Castiles has got no chance, but. I think throughout the, the whole, it was the way that Frankfurt set up. They were quite happy to let Wolfsburg have the ball um, and then hit them on the counter. And that's what they did a couple of times, just played the ball down uh, down the channels, which I it made me question Martin Schmidt a little bit because although it looked like the formation was a um, 4-4-2 with a, a double pivot, um, Marley and Brekelo were so narrow. I mean, even afterwards that the teams push out to show you the stats, etc. They had Wolfsburg as a 4-2-2-2, which is why Frankfurt were getting so much joy down the side. I don't know if they were worried about Frankfurt playing through the middle of them with Boateng, but he was able to just spray the ball left and right. Um, and they were very, very good. They were Wobbled a little bit once um, Wolfsburg scored. Wolfsburg had a really good chance um, to get a couple in quick succession, which was sort of spoilt when um, DiMarta was sent off almost instantly after the goal went in. So that sort of said goodbye to any resurgence from them that they had. But um, apart from, I would say, that 10-minute spell, it was all Frankfurt. And, and wow, they just blew them away inside of four minutes. So I put in the match report that's on football stat there that the... Um, it was a two quick goals, two goals inside three or four, four minutes. It, Wolfsburg never recovered from that. I got a lot of time for Frankfurt this year, Bryce. I, I think that Niko Kovac is one of the most interesting coaches in the league at the moment. The, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about this, Chris, but does that 3-5-2 that at the time looks like 3-3-4 um, three, three, because Boateng Kazinovic is so attacking-minded in that lineup. But at the same time, I also so hard working. It makes it, it's a very, very interesting look, isn't it? With this ability to be very hard pressed and attack, but also very hard working defense. And I always liken them a little bit to Atletico Madrid's, um, Simeone team a bit, you know, that, that hard work, no nonsense approach, but at the same time, a squad with a lot of good players that all can play good football. Yeah, definitely. And and that's so we ran the live blog again from the stadium on a minute by minute report from the stadium. And, and um, if anyone wants to look back on that, they'll see me make clear reference to the fact that Frankfurt were flying in with the tackles. And I think we saw that last season, uh, but it went a bit too far on occasion, didn't it? And they sort of lost their discipline and lost their composure. Whereas um, from what I've seen in this season, especially seeing them up live, they've got that nice balance now of being able to be hard but fair, and then still being able to play really good football. I mean, they were happy to um, sit back and then hit on the counter. They are happy to go and press by tackling hard and then looking to the break. And I think you identify the two midfielders there, and and that's quite right because they almost like they've got free license and an understanding between them that if one goes, the other will stay. But boy, when that one does go, they go at speed. Yeah, and this is a, this is a side that just got Uma Mascarell back, who's very important for the side, you know, the, the center pivot. And Marco Fabian, uh, you know, our friend Max Riegel has said that he probably ate a few too many tacos back home on holiday in Mexico, a little bit carrying a little bit of belly. But once he's back, because Marco Fabian was one of the best players in the league last year before he got hurt. So he's not even back yet. Once he's coming back, that's this side will be even more attractive. And... um yeah, we talked about last year how they had too many red cards and that that almost hurt them in a way and really cost them the second half of the season. I I feel like Nico Kovac as a personality has grown and his 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 tactics have matured without giving up the the foundation of them. And that's that's really something quite interesting. I I feel that Frankfurt could be maybe one of those teams that could surprise us and sneak into those European places at the end of the season. I think it's key as we've mentioned before that certain teams are great. You know, that um, the sum of the, is greater than the parts involved. And if you look at the three players that were brought on uh, on Saturday, they all had, you know, a decent 
a decent showing. Although Williams only came on for four minutes, he still looked okay, put himself around a well. Bojovic came on and should have scored instantly and pretty much did score quite soon after that. You know, he was in the right place at the right time. His movement was exceptional. Um, even when Fernandez came on into that central area, he looked good as well. So I think for Frankfurt fans, it must be an exciting time because they do have strength in depth. And, and you've just mentioned players coming back in as well, which will only add to that strength. And we're bound to see the uh, maybe one or two of the players that are in the starting lineup at the moment rotating through either with tiredness or injury. But there's, there's a good feeling, I think, down at Frankfurt. I was um, lucky enough to get the train um, home with some of their fans. And uh, if I said they were in a buoyant mood, that would be the understatement of the year. In fact, they were that buoyant that we got delayed just outside Berlin for 10 minutes while the police came on and tried to just quell their buoyancy a bit. Um, but it was all very good natured and they were a really good bunch of lads um, and they were talking football and they enjoyed talking football and they were really impressive what they saw. So I get the feeling, Bryce, that there's um, and Manny, that there's uh, there's a nice little mini revolution going on in Frankfurt at the moment. Which would be great because, you know, we, we identified a few clubs last season, Hamburg, Köln, Frankfurt, Berlin, from big cities, singles, you know, where they're the only club in that city. And I, I kind of flying a little bit below the radar. And I feel like Frankfurt are one of those sites and they, they're building um, to something and there is the backing financially there that they could one day challenge, you know, the likes of Bayern. Another one is, of course, Stuttgart that we also often talked about, right? That are also good stuff is happening in Stuttgart too. That it's just that they're all in that zone right now where they're growing and it, it, it takes a little bit of time and a little bit of patience. But I, I feel like Frankfurt, they're getting close. They're getting close to really doing something quite special there. Yeah, it seems a very long time ago. Uh, the Rick Runder last year when Frankfurt were, they got up as high as second, hadn't they? But then completely dropped off. Mm-hmm. They could barely pick up a, a win or, or even a point. I think they were, they went, was it nine games or eight games? Um, losing streak, something I guess. It was pretty awful. But they seem to have really come on this year. And as you've said, Manu, you, that they spent quite a bit of money, probably quite a few players, didn't they, um, this season? And seems to be paying off, especially in my man, Sebastian Haller. He's doing wonders in my fantasy football team, may I say. But um, the real test will be next weekend. Uh, Chris, they're going to be playing uh, Borussia Mönchengladbach. That's that's going to be a really big game on the uh, Friday night. Yeah, well, and that'll be a really good test because uh, <laughs> sometimes I don't think you know what um, Gladbach you see. You either get that exciting Gladbach or you get the Gladbach that falls apart a little bit like um, one of the teams we're going to mention in a moment, I think. Yeah, yeah, I suppose we better get this out of the way. Let's talk about Leverkusen. Come on, Manu, what have you got to say? In a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I thought we'd probably talk about that. Yeah, to be fair, <laughs> Leverkusen, they've, they've been very impressive this year. Uh, Chris and I thought, nah, no chance that they'll compete uh, for the title or even be up that high in the league. But um, you know, we're, we're going to have to give you some credit, Manny. You, you predicted this one. And yeah, another uh, impressive uh, weekend for them. Uh, what, what exactly have they done here, uh, Manu, to, um, you know, to carry this through? I mean, you made the prediction early doors, but what was it made you predict that? I mean, a 4-1 win this weekend against Hoffenheim. I mean, that that's about as impressive as it, as it comes, really. Well, there's, there's been a few other ones. I think they beat Gladbach 5-1 earlier in the season. Um, I think... When you look at the Leverkusen side, they're definitely benefiting from the fact that Dortmund and Leipzig having an absolute blinder of a season. Um, there's no better ways to putting it. But at the same time, the, the things that when I when I looked at Leverkusen ahead of the season, I saw that the fact that they brought in Sven Bender, who I think is is someone they're really missing right now in Dortmund, um, because he brings them a lot of stability and he can pl- fill various roles. And then they got rid of, and this sounds really bad, they got rid of a couple of bad apples in Kevin Campbell and uh, Hakan Kalanoglu, who I thought were very bad for the dressing room. They brought in an excellent coach in Heiko Herrlich. And then they have the biggest benefits of all, that they don't play in the Champions League or Europa League. So they can they can rest throughout match days and they can develop all these young guys, lots of young, exciting players that they have. I mean, they brought in the Argentinian striker, Lucas Alario, who... Nico featured for us on uh, Fußballstadt.com and I, I, he was fantastic. He scored two goals. He's still getting used a little bit to the league. 
Folland is having a great season too. He was ahead of this match day. He was the top scoring German striker in the Bundesliga. And, you know, we always thought that he would develop into that kind of player. And I, I seen him from when he was very young at the 1860 Academy, right? So he has made a big step forward under Heiko Herrlich. Probably helps that Heiko Herrlich was a top striker himself in this league. And, He's really helped the likes of Alario and Folland. But I think the number one thing is, and we already touched on this last week, right, Chris, is Leon Bailey. Leon Bailey is a revelation in this league. And I fire Leverkusen, and I know there's going to be offers coming in left, right, and center for this guy from England, from Bayern, Dortmund. Everyone is going to want a piece of this kid because he's fantastic. I mean, when you watch him, he's a 19-year-old Frank Ribéry. He is absolutely brilliant. The pace is breathtaking. He he goes through players like it's like a ski slalom. And when you watch what he does, and he had some slow motion shots on on television over here where it just showed where he was going through players. It's unbelievable what he does at this high speed, and um, he's really grown because when he first came in, there was a couple couple scandals surrounding him, and he's really grown into the kind of personality where he's like just stuck down and said, "Well, I, look, I'm here to play football, and that's it." And even with the transfers and offers that are apparently coming in, he's just he's just playing football. And I think that's quite a revelation. And if they're able to reach the Champions League next season and hang on to this kit at the same time, this is really early predictions, of course. But I would say that next year, they could be one of the teams that will actually challenge, seriously challenge for the title. Because, of course, this is something that I also said, and I'm slightly wrong about this, because no one but Bayern will challenge for the title this year. But I think that there is something happening there. Not unlike the things that we talked about in Frankfurt, but they could they could actually with this squad that they have now add another one or two pieces, keep the key players. They could they could do something really special next year. It wouldn't be the holiday season if there wasn't candy, right? Celebrate the holiday season with the Holiday Crush. They've sprinkled candy with a holiday theme and fun-packed challenges every week for five whole weeks, finishing on January 4th. The more challenges you complete, the better your chances of unwrapping delicious rewards. So, are you ready to crush the holidays? Play the Holiday Crush now. Download it from the App Store, Google Play, or Windows Store for free. Terms and conditions apply. Yeah, well, things are definitely on the up for Leverkusen, and yeah, we. I think uh, Chris and I just had to take a back seat there, really, and just um, accept that everything you were saying was probably right, to be honest. Uh, but it's it's very tight up there. You never know what could happen. Uh, Chris, uh, do you think that uh, Leverkusen will be in the Champions League, you know, next year after the both of us kind of laughing it off at the start of the season? I think we laughed off the fact that Manu said they'd win the league. Let's let's make, let's. Put I that said down, challenge. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think he said challenge to be fair. Yeah, he made them. Um, <laughs> Which was still laughable. <laughs> yeah, look, they were poor last season. Yeah, they were. Uh, well, we uh, hold on a minute. Can we really say that they're challenging for the league? No, then um, not. Well, well, they're up there. They're, they're top of the second league. The, the mini Bundesliga inside the main Bundesliga. They're top of that. But I think... What, what we've seen from Bayer Leverkusen is they've got an exceptional midfield at the moment and it might be one of the biggest and the oldest cliches in football, but the midfield is the engine room of any particular team and they have got talent spread from left to right or right to left, whichever way you want to look at it. So it comes as no surprise then that they're punching quite high and sitting at second at the moment. And Manu's right, uh, Bailey's incredible it was a particularly drab part of the first half when I um, got that message from Manu saying, oh, you need to see Bailey's goal at half time." So that uh, gave me an extra impetus to run down the steps at Wolfsburg and into the press box or in, underneath where they've got all the Sky um, Sport replays. And, and yeah, wow, what a goal it was. Um, so, yeah, for me, it's their midfield. I think their midfield's exceptional and that's what's tying it together. But... I mean, Hoffenheim, they either play well or they get absolutely spanked and they've been spanked again. And um, Nagelsmann was ever the um, reflective guy afterwards. Uh, I saw that on television. And yeah, he is he's having to do his development very publicly at the moment. And I think we were right by suggesting that 
a step up to somewhere like Bayern Munich is just a little bit too soon for him. Hoffenheim are poor right now. They're just very poor. I, I'm a little worried about them, that they they could further drop down the standings. I don't think they're going to be anywhere near a European place by the end of the season. And let's not, yeah, let's not forget that they probably punched a bit too high, didn't they, last season? Um, but I don't think we would have expected the sort of fall off we've seen. It's going to be interesting in the next couple of weeks for the, for the matches they've got to see just you know, where they are, let's say, the end of February. I think by the end of February, if they continue on this problem, they could be sitting around about 11th, which would be a disaster for them after last season. Mm, Bayern next weekend in Munich. I think we can all expect what will happen there in the current form. Yeah, yeah I mean, as Chris says, uh, Manu, do, do you think this is, well, do you think this is them going back to really where, where they belong? I mean, you know, when Nagelsmann took over, they they were almost relegated. Well, I don't think they're a relegation candidate, but the ownership around Dietmar Hopp always said the club has to be self-caring, right? And the reality is they are from a small town. Even if you don't ignore Hoffenheim and place them in Sinsheim, right? Even that is not a huge place. The stadium holds 30,000. You know, that that's not the biggest stadium in Germany. So if they are truly a self-carrying team that has to finance itself, there will be a team like Mainz, Augsburg, Freiburg. You know, that's a reality for them because if you, if you take economic reality, and that includes a huge stadium, a huge, it includes the backing of a big metropolitan area. Um, that means that you can't compete with Frankfurt. You can't compete with Berlin. You can't compete with Hamburg. You can't compete with Stuttgart. You know, even the, the, the rural part, of course, Schalke, Dortmund, they have a huge metropolitan backing in behind them. They have big stadiums. And then if, if, if Hobbs says, okay, well, well we're going to, I'm going to turn this into mini Chelsea and I'm going to put a lot of money into it. Then of course they're going to be a big competitor, but if if you just make them a self-sustainable club, which is, seems to be the idea, then they will always have to sell their best players, just like Freiburg, Mainz, and all the other smaller teams have to. Which is fair. That's fair enough, right? But then you have to expect them to finish mid-table year in and year out, and then that also makes it really hard to hang on to a coach like Julian Nagelsmann. You know, let's say that they've got one win in their last five. Uh, failing to win any of their last three. Um, going away to uh, Bayern Munich is going to be a rather tough ask, isn't it? Since unfortunately they're going to have to pull something special out of the bag. Where well, Leverkusen, they'll be taking on Mainz, who managed a 3 2 victory this weekend. But guys, we're, we're going to move on and talk because we're about Bayern and Schalke because we haven't got much time left, really. But uh, the Gretzka deal has been done. We can confirm that, can't we, Chris? Um, oh, yeah, we can, yeah. That's, that's a done deal. I mean, you only have to look at um, the banners around the ground at Schalke today to see that, yep, that's definitely been that's a strange situation for me. Now, um, we talked earlier, didn't we? Uh, I think that's almost becoming an unworkable agreement, um, especially for um, Goretzka, because he is now in a situation where he's getting booed. Um, there, a video surfaced, I think it was... This morning, or it may have been yesterday, I watched it when I was in Berlin, of someone from the crowd, um, I paraphrase this, if I haven't got my kid with you, I'll come over and smack you in the face now. It was yeah. something like that. Um, and <laughs> can he can he put up with that? He was booed when he was substituted today, like, like really badly booed. Is that an, an atmosphere that Schalke can can live with as a club because it's going to upset them uh, it's going to upset their balance and they've been playing fantastically you know could they look at potentially pulling that deal forward for the sake of themselves and I mean they may not really be bothered about Goetzka anymore but it's that circus that's now going to follow the club with him being booed and fans you know not booed in his shirt as such, but going through that metaphorical process, it may be better that he was to go now. And that's what Clemens Tony said today, right? If Romanigi calls him, he would pick up the phone. Quote. And he also said that of course that was that statement was negated uh, literally an hour later because Goretzka actually played today. But he said, Well, if you have to we bench him until the end of the season. Um yeah, then they did end up playing him anyways because 
Tony Sauzo added that, that it's the coaching decision. But it's, it's an interesting question, right? That what do you do with, with Goretzka until the end of the year? And I think the, the big disappointment is because he actually agreed to a deal with Schalke before the Confed Cup. And it was apparently all but signed. Like the, the lawyers had already agreed on everything and this was, the decision was made and they wanted to announce it at the big uh, membership meeting in August that Goretzka was signing a new deal. And then the Comfort Cup happened. You know, Neubauer met Bayern and he said, oh, I want to wait till January to announce a new deal. And I think that's what tipped Schalke fans off. Not saying that what Schalke fans are doing, I think that kind of behavior has no place in football. But um, I think that's what really tipped them off is the fact that he basically went back on a deal. It, it seemed like that he almost went back on the Bayern deal as well, right, Chris? I mean, this is the, this is his agent was basically drumming all over Europe and making trying to sell his client left, right, and center. Oh yeah, he was, and there was he was trying to sell him to Barcelona. He was trying to get Liverpool on board. He's sounding a little mercenary to me, and that's never a good thing if you're a football player. You don't want to come across as a mercenary because if he goes to Bayern, what are the Bayern fans going to think? They probably won't care because they're going to get you know, the future German national player. But at the back of their mind, is this guy only here for a little bit? What happens if he has a really good season and, and a Real Madrid come knocking on the door? Will he go? So you don't want that sort of reputation. But Himself, he's a good player, but I think this is a, a really bad situation for him now. Um, I think he's broken his word with, with the club that he's looked upon as 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 a really big player and, and someone that all the young fans look up to and someone that even the older fans thought was a, a good guy. It's a hard one for me, this. I, I would be tempted to let him go now. Um, but whether Bayern would buy a player, who they're going to get for free in six months is different. You know, different matter. Yeah, give him a couple million and make a deal done better, a little than nothing. Actually, I put this question to Twitter, Chris. We have a couple of things that we asked our our Twitter community, and um, sixty five percent of my Twitter followers or the followers on Football Grad Live said um, Schalke should, should sell him now. Um, that's yeah, I'll, I'll agree with that. Yeah, I think so too. I think today you could sort of sense, you know, they 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 gave away a game against Hannover that they should, in my books, have won. And you could sense that with everything that's going on, it's it's hurting the club. Yeah, especially when they've got aspirations to, um, well, not just get into Europe, but you know, they they're still in, you know, that competition for that Champions League spot as well. I mean, surely getting rid of uh, that poison in the dressing room, you know, could, could only be a good thing, you would imagine. But uh, I suppose it's uh, all all the cards are in. You know, Bayern Munich's hands, would you agree, Manu? I mean, it's, it's going to come ultimately down to them whether they want to pay. Yeah, and how much, right? Um, I, I, as I said, we'll probably, if it happens, I'm not saying it does, but if, if, some, if a deal can be agreed to bring him in now, I don't think Bayern would, would say no to that because he would be eligible for the Champions League as well and maybe add a little bit extra, although they were fantastic today. Um, I, I that was a really really good display of football uh, by both Bremen and Bayern. I, I thought it was a fantastic game. I did the match report for Fußballstadt.com and really enjoyed it. Um, so there is a lot going on at that side right now already, and I, I would be hard pressed to see where he could where where we, we where, where you would put him. But you know, there's always room for another good player, and I'm pretty sure Bayern would happily take him now and pay Schalke maybe a little bit extra, um, so everyone can save face. I mean, it's, some people have been suggesting um, a loan move for the rest of the season uh, to somebody else. Uh, I, I mean, I, I would be very surprised if that happened. But Chris, do, do you see that as a possibility or, or, or is it not possible? Is it done to his contract? Um, I, I don't think that would be um, a viable possibility, whether he's allowed to do it in his contract or not. Um, I'm not sure who would want to take him on because, in essence, you're just going to develop a player for Bayern Munich. He certainly wouldn't be taken on, I don't think, at any of the top six in England because why would you want to loan a player with that? You had no option of signing or 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 getting anything really out of in the long term. Um, yeah, it would be a foolish decision for any club 
to loan him because all they're going to do is give him game time, especially in Germany, is give him game time to develop his um, his play to make him stronger for Bayern next season, which I don't think any of the other um, 17 teams would want to do. I would be very surprised if that happened. But let's see what happens in the uh, coming uh, days or weeks uh, when we've got... Um... We've got a little bit of time left in January, haven't we? So let, let's see what happens in this one. Guys, uh, let's move on to an interesting, um, well, a bit of an interesting situation at the opposite end of the Bundesliga. Uh, Manu and I suggested last week that um, there's a possibility that Cologne could actually pull themselves out of uh, their situation. And they've increased the possibility of this happening for a win over the weekend um, against Hamburg, winning 2-0 in the late kickoff on Saturday. Uh, Manu, you've got a bit of a wager with your dad, haven't you? Um, how's this one looking for you? Better and better every day. <laughs> um, it's It wasn't really a wager. It was just, I had I have a had a gut feeling I don't know why, um, that Köln will, will pull themselves out of this. And of course, it'd be the greatest escape in Bundesliga history. And, um, right now it seems like they can't stop winning. <laughs> and the, the next match, I believe they're playing Augsburg next week, right? True. That's another yeah. winnable game. Um, very winnable game. And this match, they worked in their favor. They won, they beat Hamburg. And Hamburg are now in complete disarray. They Hamburg fired Gistol and replaced him with Bernd Hollerbach. And Köln are just they, they look good in this game at times. Simon Terode is is a massive steal for them. Um that second goal that he scored was was just brilliant. And and maybe, just maybe they can pull it off. Of course I, I think the only way they could pull it off is if they finish sixteenth and then the relegation playoffs. I think the anything else would be a step too far at this point, but it's look the other two teams that are down there with him, Hamburg and uh, Bremen. I I feel that those three teams are in big trouble um, in general, and those three teams will decide between them between themselves who's going to go straight down and who's going to be in the relegation playoffs. Maybe Mainz, Chris. You sometimes say Mainz as well, right? That's another team that's that has to worry a little bit as well. Yeah, m- although. I can't see them dropping that much now in Mainz. They've worried me all season, really. I, I didn't think they'd been particularly good at any stage throughout. Um, but they've got that four-point cushion, but it only takes one more loss for them and the others to make up ground for them then to start panic. And then you've got one point for the rest of the season and then you may be looking at goal difference, etc. But I'm with you, Manu. I, I think those three are definitely going to be in it. And Mainz are a worry, but also now Stuttgart. Um, and even Wolfsburg have been getting dragged back into that area where they don't want to be. So, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting. I think the once again, like last season, it's the bottom end of the table has also got an interesting point as towards the top end, maybe the fight for the European places, we should call it, not the top end of the table. Yeah, I'm really, I mean, Köln is the big one right, right now. If they win another game and the, the results go their way, then all of a sudden that gap to the relegation spot is only one point. And then I guess we really have to start talking about it, right? Can they actually pull it off? And if things really go their way, then the, it's only a five-point gap to the not-relegation not spots. And, I mean, that's that's crazy to think about, but because it's so tight down there, it, it's actually possible. I think if you're locked in a relegation battle and all of a sudden you put two good results together back to back and one of them's a big result, it's like a you know a, a derby game, then um, maybe you can start dreaming. I, I would be surprised, very surprised, if, if they pulled themselves out of it. But maybe Manu, you said that relegation playoff might be the one to aim for because you know I'm sure they feel they would be stronger than whoever finished in third place in the um, second Bundesliga. And you got the momentum on your side because you've been basically playing playoff football your, the entire second half of the season. Every game you were in was a must win situation, right? And if you go into, if you had that entire mentality throughout the season, a playoff game is just another two games that you have to win because you've already been doing it for 17 games straight. And I think that that helps them. I mean, when we, when we talk about, um, this is this is a theme that we often have in the Liga MX podcast or the, the we call it soccer podcast or MLS podcast, right? 
the fact that you have to have momentum when you go into the playoffs is often better for the teams that are at the bottom half because they've been fighting for that playoff spot. Well, Köln is basically doing the same thing right now. They, they have a playoff game every match day where they're just fighting for survival. So if they end up on that 16th spot, they'll be massive favorites to stay in because they've been doing it for half a year at that point. Yeah, most certainly. And if we look at the fixtures coming up next weekend as well, we're, we're talking about Cologne only being a win away from, well, really closing in on them, just being a point away. But you've got you've got them at home to Osberg. Uh, you've got Werner Bremen at home to Hertha. You'll, they'll be glad to be a home late kickoff on Saturday, taking them on. But uh, RB Leipzig at home uh, to Hamburg. Hamburg, that that's that's a very tricky game in Leipzig. I mean, uh, Chris, we, we've seen uh, Marcus Gistel um, lose his job today. Um, that just shows you how worried Hamburg actually are about the whole situation. Um, do you see being in uh, in time for this game? And if so, is there a possibility of a new coach bounce, as they talk about? Wow, a new coach bounce. Well, they're going to need something, aren't they? And they're going to need more than a bounce because... It's just been constant for Hamburg as in the finishing the end of the season, you know, um, squeaky bum time. Uh, uh, We discussed this last week. The players they've got, they should be playing better than they are. But it's a mentality around the place at the moment. And, you know, I think Manu mentioned it. I would be turning that clock off now. Um, Now they're in 17th. Turn it off. It's it's an extra... um, It's an extra... It's an extra thing they don't need. They don't need to have that... um, constant thing on the back so like we said last week i would turn that clock off and whoever comes in it's going to be a a massive job a massive job yeah bernd hollerbach is the new guy chris uh würzburg coach last season he was part of that uh, miracle that saw würzburg go up to bundesliga two and um almost you know had a fantastic first half of the season and then crashed down the board to the bottom of the table and got relegated um He's a former Hamburg player. He's um, he's a disciple of Felix Magath, Iron Magath. So you know, his Hamburg players um, are no longer going to work on the transition game for the last few weeks. I can tell you that. <laughs> oh my God, they're going to be catching med balls or something. <laughs> yeah, it's it's going to be uh, life is. I think it's life is not going to be quite as cushiony. I think personally, I think that um, that's the kind of coach that you need. If you're in a relegation battle, um, working on the finer parts of your tactical game is not going to stay, keep you staying in the league. Because as you said, the squad is there. The level of the squad is there. They, what they need is, is someone to, to tell them how to fight. Because when I watched I watched that Hamburg-Köln game quite closely in the match report for football.com, and the, the thing that I noticed was that Köln were fighting tooth and nail to get that result. They knew they had to win this game no matter what. This had to be a game that they had to win. And they did. In the end of the day, they did. Because they were not the better side. Although, you know, the returns of Jonas Hector and Simon Terode, the addition of Simon Terode, gave them that little bit extra that they needed. And uh, Timo Horn was absolutely fantastic. But in the end of the day, they were the team that wanted it more. And sometimes you need a coach that just teaches you that. You know, that that, that the lust to win. And Hamburg don't have that right now, and I don't. I couldn't see Gistol giving that them um, that determination to win games. Um, Manu, we talked about the games that they've got uh, coming up uh, next weekend. And for these three sides, it really is going to be looking at each game as a must-win. You know, as it gets closer and closer. Uh, how do you see next week going? Who do you see uh, coming out on top? Do you see Cologne continuing on that upward trajectory? They're playing Augsburg, right? Yeah, you love Augsburg. Oh, so that's that's a win for them. Um, I think that, <laughs> so biased. I think that Leipzig, Leipzig have been bouncing back and forward all over the place. We didn't have very much time to talk about Leipzig because they were disappointing this match day. Um, but they're back home, and I th- they usually seem to bounce back from a bad result quite quickly. So I think they're going to win their game. And Werder Bremen against Hertha, that's. I mean, you just saw Hertha, Chris. What do you think? I think Hertha, a very boring side to watch, but yet they always get their results. Yeah, they were. Um, I think boring might be a little harsh for them on Friday night. They certainly took it 
to a poor Dortmund side. But once Borussia Dortmund sort of put their foot down, they sort of crumbled. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say somewhere between boring and um, all right. Yeah, maybe effective to be nice. <laughs> Don't even think they're effective. Let's say they're, let's, I'm just going to go with all right. They're all right. They're very nice people, but they're all right. Yeah. Well, well, do we see them getting a victory against Werner Bremen or Werner Bremen going to you know, try and seed themselves? That's got draw written all over it. Yeah, it does. Werder were actually pretty good against Bayern, Bryce. You know, they, they just... The very thing that worried me about Werder is, you know, they had the lead and then they had... Um, they managed a 2-2 draw after, after Lewandowski got Bayern ahead and um, they... Instead of shutting sh- shop, they kept attacking and I think that was... That was that was a bad mistake. So um, I... I think Werder, and this has been a part of Werder Bremen for many, many years. They just don't know how to to get their defensive working. So that's the one thing that really worries me about them. Um, and if their attack isn't firing, they're in big trouble. And Hertha are the kind of side that just shuts down a team and gets the result that they need. Well, I think that more or less does it for uh, this week. But uh, Chris, I'm, I'm going to go to you uh, on this. Um, obviously, you were at the Wolfsburg Eintracht Frankfurt game this weekend. So, um, as far as uh, football grads go, who who have they not covered? Who is football grad not covered in the Bundesliga this season? Because there can't be many left. Uh, no, we're just down to three teams now. So, um, Bayer Leverkusen, we need to see live. Um, and we need to see Mainz and Augsburg, which um, I think I will go and watch in March. We'll just tick them off, get them out of the way. And that's Augsburg against Mainz, um, which should leave us May when we're all over in May. Hopefully we'll squeeze a uh, Bayer Leverkusen game on and that will have been all 18 teams covered by the end of the season. Wow, fantastic, eh? Wow, well done, team. Well, that more or less does it. Um, let's go to you, Manu. What, what have you got going on this week? What would you like to draw people's attention to on the Football Grand Network? Yeah, so we got plenty of match reports from this from this match day so they're all up on um fußballstadt.com and then footballgrad.com we mostly do scout reports these days and a couple of historical pods um great historical pod out um on the fall of the soviet of the fall of soviet football um on footballgrad.com so i did that together with tim um I personally think it, it's a quite interesting podcast to so go check that out. And yeah, next week is going to be more of the same. We're going to have previews um, later in the week for Fußballstadt.com for the Bundesliga games and a few scouting reports. And then we cover whatever transfer, probably the Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang story. The way things are going is going to be something that we'll cover. Very nice. Always busy. And Chris, uh, you're obviously going to be back in the country, back in the UK this uh, coming weekend. Uh, but what, what have you got going on? Well, people can read our um, not just our match reports from the weekend, but also our live action as it happened. That's all on fushballstat.com. And then this week, as Manu says, it's just back to normal running. So we'll be doing the previews. Like you said, um, 99.9% chance that we'll be running the minute by minute report for the Frankfurt Gladbach game. And then for one of the um, half past 30 kickoffs in Germany, we'll be doing some match reports as well. Lovely jubbly. And no doubt, uh, Manu, you'll be running a few Twitter polls as the week goes mm. on as well. Quite, quite enjoying them at the moment. It's good interaction, eh, for the pod. Definitely. So, yeah, we'll, we'll keep them up. I'll try and come up with a few ideas. I think all of us should do. But uh, the only thing I'd like to uh, draw all your attention to, apart from everything going on in the Football Grad Network, uh, you can find it all on Twitter at Football Grad Live, is the Glatzo uh, Mexican Football Podcast will be recorded tomorrow night. So that should be with you in, I'll say, probably 48 hours or so. Um, but yeah, that'll be exciting. We should have Oli, Manu, and I back together again, rather than just myself. Uh, but any. Um, thanks for tuning in um, if you're enjoying the podcast please leave us uh, some positive feedback on the likes of uh, iTunes or just get in touch on Twitter we'd really appreciate to hear what you have to say what you feel we should discuss but apart from that uh, thanks for tuning in and our feeders in Ich war seit Wochen auf diesen Tag Und tanz vor Freude 
über den Asphalt, als wär's ein Rhythmus, als gäb's ein Lied, das mich immer weiter durch die Straßen zieht. Komm dir entgegen, dich abzuholen. It wouldn't be the holiday season if there wasn't candy, right? Celebrate the holiday season with the Holiday Crush. They've sprinkled candy with a holiday theme and fun-packed challenges every week for five whole weeks, finishing on January 4th. The more challenges you complete, the better your chances of unwrapping delicious rewards. So, are you ready to crush the holidays? Play the Holiday Crush now. Download it from the App Store, Google Play, or Windows Store for free. Terms and conditions apply. Thank you for listening to Believe. You can show support to your host by subscribing to the show and giving us a five-star rating on your preferred platform. Check us out at Believe.com and search for B-L-E-A-V on YouTube. Ever felt judged at the gym? You don't know how to use the leg curl machine? <laughs> Are you serious? This is your first day alive? Um... <laughs> no, it's okay. I love helping people during their first day on Earth. At Planet Fitness, get energy without the judgment and join the judgment-free zone. Never intimidating, always free fitness training and equipment for every workout. Get energized today during the big fitness energy sale for 24 cents down, $10 a month. Cancel anytime. Deal ends Friday, January 12th. See Home Club for details.